Hello everyone and welcome to the second of Advocata's video series on the tea industry of Sri Lanka. Unlike other major tea producing countries like China, India and Kenya, Sri Lanka does not have an abundance of land. This means that capital investments aimed at enhancing the productivity of agricultural land is of utmost importance. When it comes to the tea industry, replanting, where all tea bushes past their prime are replaced with new bushes, is the most important capital investment that a planter could make into their land. Replanting is particularly important if an estate is still covered in seedling tea bushes, which are less productive than the newer vegetatively propagated variant of the bush, which has more uniform cover, leading to greater efficiency. In filling, where the gaps left by deceased tea bushes in an existing cultivation are filled with new bushes, is also an important form of long-term capital investment. The tea bush reaches its prime between 50 to 60 years in the upcountry and 30 to 40 years in the low country. Beyond this age, the yield of a tea bush sees a substantial drop, which is a major lag on the productivity of tea estates. This is why the Tea Research Institute recommends that at least 2.5% of the extent of a tea cultivation be replanted every year. However, the actual rates of replanting by both large estates and smallholders are substantially below this target. Sri Lanka falls behind many other tea producing countries when it comes to the average yield per hectare in the island's tea lands. There are many factors that affect the average tea yield of a country, like the availability of labour and the productivity of labour. Higher labour availability and higher labour productivity are two of the primary reasons why the yield is relatively higher in India and Kenya. The low yields in both Sri Lanka and China are partly explained by the low rates of replanting in both countries, in addition to their reliance on orthodox processing methods, which make their teas world famous, but results in lower quantities of made tea from the same amount of green leaf. Given that lower rates of long-term capital investment are clearly affecting the productivity of Sri Lanka's tea industry, it is important that we diagnose the root causes of the deterrence to necessary investment. For this, we use the Growth Diagnostic Framework introduced in 2005 by economists Ricardo Hausmann, Danny Roderick and Andres Velasco, which investigates the binding constraints to necessary private investment that impede growth in macroeconomic settings. Based on the Growth Diagnostic Framework, we identify that the low and non-immediate returns to replanting which primarily arise from the long gestation period that a planter has to wait to start harvesting a replanted tea bush is a major disincentive to replanting. Net present value calculations show that at present rates of plucking, even 55 years after replanting, upcountry estates will barely break even on the cost of the investment. In the low country too, when replanting is due again 35 years into initial replanting, planters would not still have recovered the cost of first replanting. Of course, this math is based on the current rate of plucking, which is one plucking round every two weeks because of the severe labour shortage at tea estates. If plucking is to take place every seven days as recommended, replanting would be a much more feasible investment on the part of plantation companies. This shows that the lack of replanting at the estate level is not in reality a result of economic constraints, but one of physical constraints imposed by the scarcity of labour. Our estimates show that until the estate workforce is approximately doubled from its current number, plantation companies are unlikely to make serious investments in replanting. Even if plantation companies make serious investments in replanting, Questions about the appropriability of the returns of replanting pose a second binding constraint to higher levels of replanting by plantation companies. Currently, the management leases of plantation companies are set to expire in 2045, with no official decision on the extension of the leases. Given that it will likely take longer than 2045 to break even on the costs of replanting today, plantation companies are unlikely to make serious investments in replanting until and unless this uncertainty is removed. Additionally, 
the erratic pattern of policy decisions by governments in the past do not give planters the confidence that future policy decisions will align with the best interests of the industry. The micro risks arising from erratic government policy making is another binding constraint that disincentivizes long term capital investments into the tea lands. The bans on glyphosate and chemical fertilizer in the recent past are examples of such policy decisions that proved detrimental to the profitability of the industry. In this context, even if planters were to make investments into replanting, there is no guarantee that the industry will survive for them to be able to reap the returns of such investments. When it comes to the smallholder sector, the lack of savings is a major binding constraint to investments into replanting. To begin with, many smallholders who enter the trade recently are unaware of the need to replant. Even if smallholders recognize the importance of replanting, most do not have the financial means to engage in replanting and cannot afford to forego the harvest on their tea lands until the new tea bushes reach the age of harvesting. The Tea Shakti Fund and the Tea Export Cess are two noteworthy schemes that the government has come up with to address this issue. The Tea Shakti Fund, established in 2000, is meant to subsidize the replanting and infilling activities undertaken by smallholders. But smallholders find the fund to be barely of any help, and the delays in obtaining the funding make it more appealing to secure funding from private lenders. On the other hand, the tea export says, which was originally meant to subsidize activities in the green leaf stage, such as replanting, has done little to promote such investments. The funds collected from the tax are routed directly to the Consolidated Fund at the Treasury Department, rendering no ability to track how the money is spent. These binding constraints keep the replanting and infilling rates of Sri Lanka's tea sector at unsustainably low levels. Let's now look at what steps can be taken to remove these binding constraints and incentivize more long-term capital investments into the tea lands by plantation companies and smallholders. Every time the topic of replanting comes up, the go-to answer of many is state subsidization. The government may subsidize long-term capital investments into the tea lands by covering in part or fully the additional costs associated with replanting and infilling. The funds for this may even be collected from segments of the tea industry value chain with higher concentrations of profit pools than the green leaf stage. The tea export says, which is currently 3 rupees per kilogram of tea exported out of Sri Lanka, was originally meant to be used to subsidize long term capital investments in tea lands. The Tea Shakti Fund also pools funds from smallholders for the same purpose. But whether these funds are actually used for their intended purpose in an effective manner is another question. While not originally intended for replanting, there are other funds within the tea sector that may also be used to subsidize replanting. The tea promotion and marketing levy, which was originally another 3 rupees and 50 cents collected on every kilogram of tea exported out of Sri Lanka, is entrusted to the Sri Lanka Tea Board. Since 2019, the levy has been revised to 3 rupees per kilogram and 50% of it has been specifically designated to support replanting. However, this fund remains largely unspent. In 2021, the fund had a balance of 10 billion rupees which has accumulated over the years. Conversations with past and present chairmen of the Tea Board reveal that the bureaucratic obstacles associated with having expenses from the fund approved prevent its effective utilization. The government may relax these bureaucratic obstacles and facilitate the easy utilization of these funds for replanting activities. However, the fundamental question still remains whether subsidizing replanting is a justifiable use of public funds. In economic theory, subsidies are meant for public goods, which are non-rivalrous and non-excludable goods that the private sector underprovides or does not provide at all because of the inability to make profits from it in the free market. That is why using state funding for promoting the generic brand name of Ceylon Tea makes sense. If a private tea company were to promote the generic brand name of Ceylon Tea, other companies will be able to free ride on it and derive benefits. This discourages private companies from promoting the generic Ceylon tea brand name, which is why the Sri Lanka Tea Board does it. Replanting is therefore definitely a private good. So one can easily make the argument that limited 
public funds are better spent promoting the generic brand name of Ceylon Tea, coming up with a better regulatory mechanism for the industry and funding research and development activities that will benefit the entire tea sector and not on replanting. Given these theoretical arguments against state subsidization of replanting, it would be more economically justified if a market-based funding mechanism can be developed. Here, the Sri Lanka Tree Board may participate by extending loans, not grants, to plantation companies and smallholders for replanting activities if private creditors are unwilling to take on a risk of this nature. Even if funding is made available, the willingness of plantation companies to engage in replanting is not clear. There are other pieces of the puzzle that have to fall into place to fully incentivize plantation companies to engage in replanting. As discussed before, until the estate workforce is approximately doubled, there is little economic incentive for plantation companies to engage in replanting. The alternative wage models discussed in the first video of this series could help encourage more people to come and work at the estates, which would make replanting no longer a non-starter for most plantation companies. The expiration of the management leases of the plantation companies is the other binding constraint to replanting that needs to be immediately addressed to incentivize more plantation companies to take up replanting. Ideally, all tea lands would be privatized so that this problem would never come up again in the future. But the likelihood of that happening anytime soon is very slim, which makes an immediate lease extension the most practicable idea. By extending the leases of plantation companies, the government will be able to signal to estates that they will be able to reap the full benefits of any long-term investments into the tea lands which would incentivize replanting. Signaling that the government has the industry's best interests at heart is another crucial step which would build planter confidence in the industry. After the many erratic policy decisions in the past that added to the industry's struggles, some stakeholders no longer believe that the tea industry has a future. Restoring confidence in the industry is paramount to incentivizing more capital investments in the tea lands. Deregulation and privatization of the industry to take the government away from parts of the industry the government has no justifiable role to play would be an important first step in this direction. As for the smallholders, nothing is more important than creating awareness. The Tea Shakti Fund and the Tea Small Holdings Development Authority have huge roles to play here in educating smallholders on the importance of replanting and providing the necessary support for it. The industry should not, however, depend solely on the government to incentivize these necessary investments. There is plenty of room for private companies to partner with smallholders and elevate the standards of production among the tea smallholder community of Sri Lanka. This would not only allow private investors to make substantial profits, but will also increase the revenues of smallholder farms, most of whom struggle to stay afloat with their current incomes from the trade.